Hey, good afternoon, guys. Welcome to Domain Analytics. So in past three days, we have seen what is our agenda and what all the concepts we have to explain, right? So in day one, so when we do a recap of day one, day two, day three, so I'm just going to say what all we have done, okay? And after that, we are going to go for K-means today. So guys, in day one, we have understood our concepts. So as I said, we are going to work on automotive analytics. Okay, so guys, what is automotive? We have seen the introduction of automotive. What is the benefits? What are the advantages? What are the challenges we are going to face? And what is our conclusions? Let's see in day one, guys, when we go to the introduction, so we have seen automotive analytics. So it is nothing but an analytical capability which may automatically detect and relevant anomalies, patterns, and trends. Okay, so where we can deliver insights of business users in real time with no manual users. Okay. So this was what our concept was this. So automotive analytics, we are going to work with the introduction on the day when we have seen everything. So in case, if you haven't seen the introduction, you can always watch the video, which will be provided to you. So, and we have seen what are the benefits we are going to get, right? So if you ask what are the benefits of automotive analytics? So more and more the smarter, more the more it is efficient, more it is connected to different vehicles. The marketing sales will be increasing, right? There will be a boost in sales marketing. So that is the benefit of this automotive analytics and the challenges. So if you go to the challenges, what we are going to face. So we are going to see the related costs, the sustainability, the, uh, the self-driving evolution. Okay. So we'll be seeing different types of challenges. Guys. The self-driving evolution, I have given an example of the tes Tesla, which is uh, which is uh, now trending in the world, right? So automatic. So we just uh, can put in the automotive mode and the car just runs by itself. Right. So it is developing like that. So what are the challenges we may face? So the cost, of course, everyone needs the car cost must be less and the quality must be good of the car. So everything should be in a package. So we can say like that. Right. Uh, right now, the trending evolution is the self-driving evolution. So everyone needs. OK, if you're not able to drive, the, let the car drive it itself. Right. So there are these are the challenges we are going to face guys, and applications. So if you ask me applications for this, right, for the automotive analytics, the applications are what is the application, the variety analytics, <clears throat> the driver and user behavior analysis, dealer performance, and many more guys. Okay, this will be our applications. And what is our conclusion? So conclusion is nothing but this modern automobile manufacturers are tracking their progress. Okay, using RFID. So what is RFID, guys? So RFID is nothing but radio frequency identification tags. Okay, from all the above cases, we are going to see what is the data, the supply chain automotive industry, how it's going to increase our margins, how it's going to lesser down the time. Okay, and this good automotive analytics practice can go a long way, guys, okay, in attaining all the sustainable competitive advantage. So, this was all the recap of one day. Okay, the day one, what we have said, right? So, if you want more detailed explanation, you can always watch that video. Okay, and day two. So oh, day two guys, so day two, we have seen what was our agenda, right? So day two, our agenda was all about what is CRISP MLQ. Okay. CRISP MLQ is nothing but cross industry standard process for machine learning quality assurance, right? That was a full form of CRISP MLQ. And what we have seen, what is machine learning, right? So what is machine learning? Is? So machine learning is nothing but a branch of artificial intelligence and computer science. Basically it focuses on the data and the algorithms to imitate and the way that humans learn gradually, okay, like that. So machine learning is nothing uh, like basically I can say it is an important component of growing field of data science. So we know that uh, machine learning is blooming in data science and it is very important component, okay, very important things we can see. And after that we can see through all these statistical methods, algorithms are trained to make classifications of predictions, uncovering key insights with data mining projects. So guys. We know this machine learning is very important. Okay, we are going to train our algorithms and we're going to make classifications or predictions where we can get unrecorded key insights. Okay, and these insights subsequently drive decision making, like all the applications, the business, ideal impacting. Okay, so this was all about machine learning. Guys. And next thing we had was types of machine learning. So when I said types of machine learning, we had supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Okay. So we have seen unsupervised learning is nothing but unlabeled data, okay, where it's gonna get only the output. So supervised learning guys, where we have input and output. Basically, I can say unsupervised learning as, for example, self-studying student, okay, the student who studies without any lecture, 
right? He is known as unsupervised learning. Supervised learning is nothing but where the teacher is going to teach and the student is going to learn. Okay, that is called as supervised learning in simple terms. So, guys, we have seen types of machine learning, too. and after that, we have seen how data split, the model evaluation and tuning, how it's going to happen. So, what is this training, validation, and testing? Right. So, how we are going to train our model? So, I can ask a question: Why training gets more accurate? Because we are going to send our data to training, and it uh, first one learns the mathematical equations, and it's going to send it to testing. And why validation? Validation is nothing but it's a third party model, basically to avoid information leakage. Okay, we can take for that validation. Okay, so keep and validating. So you can see training what we are going to do. How we are going to build the model? Why we want test the data? Why we need validation? Okay, and after that we have seen machine learning automated analytics. So how we are going to apply this automated machine learning concepts? So what are the things we can do? quality control, predictive maintenance, supply chain optimizations, and many more. And what will be our conclusion? So, guys, in automotive industry and machine learning, it is most associated with the product innovations. Okay, what are the innovations we need? As I said, self-driving cars, Tesla race, okay, and parking and lane change. Okay, but but ML is also a significant okay, from how marketers and how they are going to establish goals to measure their investments. So can we do investment on this? Okay. Basically, we are going to see how this automotive industry is going to revolve around the world. Okay. So this is was all about day two. And we have explained about that. And if we go to day three, yes. Okay. We are just doing a recap. So after that, we'll be going to the day four. Okay, guys. Automotive analytics. Okay. The day three, we have seen the agendas. What are types of business moment we have? So I said, guys, we have four moment of business decision. Measure of central tendency, measure of dispersion, kurtosis, and skewness. Okay. So, and we have seen why do we need data preprocessing, right? So, guys, data types, as I said, continuous and discrete. The decimal point that make complete sense is called as continuous data, like four cars, right? That is a continuous data. Okay. Or else I can say 87.3. My kg is AMI weighs 87.3 kg. So, that makes sense. Right. I can't just say what discrete data means. So continuous data means guys, which makes complete sense. The decimals. I can say four cars. It makes sense. 87.3 kgs. That makes sense. Discrete data, guys. The decimal point that doesn't make any sense. Okay. I can't just say there are four and a half cars. There are four and a half of laptops. That doesn't make any sense, guys. We know that, right? Are there any four of laptops? Have you heard about the terminology? Someone using that. No, right? Because there is no valid thing like that. There is no four and a half laptops, four and a half cars. And like that, the decimal that doesn't make sense is called as discrete data. And decimal point that makes sense is called as continuous data. Okay. And after that, as I said, guys, we have four moment of business decision. And first thing is measure of central tendency. Okay. So first moment business decision, the population parameters and sample statistics. Okay. We can just see how it's going to see what is the most fitter value of the data sets. Mean, mode, median, guys. Okay, the range, the everything. Okay, the mean, median, the data set, the middle most, and mode is nothing but most repeated value. So, okay, guys. So this was about measure of central tendency. As I said, we have gone through it in the day three. So if you, in case if you have missed any session, so make sure you watch the recorded videos. Okay. So the measure of dispersion. So second moment business decision is called as measure of dispersion, and it is called as measure of Central tendency. Okay. The first thing was measure of central tendency, and the second moment business decision is measure of dispersion. And we can see we have variance, standard deviation, and range. So range guys, is nothing but maximum minimum. So whenever I say range, so what is your range and what is your minimum budget, right? So when we go to any trip, we'll ask so what is the minimum budget and what is the maximum? So how can what will be the budget? So same thing as the range and standard deviation, you can see, and the variation also you can see. So, guys, as I said, four moment business decision. And you are saying on data preprocessing, right? So, guys, whenever I say four moment business decision, you always go to data science mind map, guys. Okay, which is done by 360 digit MG. It's gonna keep on up to date, update every time. Guys. Okay, it'll be updated when there is uh, information of something okay, like data science regarding some topics are added. Okay, you can always refer this guys and make sure you read it once in a day. Okay, so it will give a good uh, memory for you. So, what you have to remember. Okay, so guys, as I said, four moment business decision. Okay, so these are the four moment business decision.
First thing was measure of central tendency, measure of dispersion, skewness, and kurtosis. So guys, skewness, as I said, so we have seen only two moment of business decisions there. So we are going to see here three moment, third moment, and fourth moment business decision. Okay. So in third moment business decision is nothing but skewness. Okay. So when is skewness and normally distributed? When skewness is equal to zero. Okay. When skewness is equal to zero, then it is normal distributed. But in kurtosis, when it is three, then it is normal distributed. Okay. So this is the one major difference you can see. Okay. When it is zero, then it is normal distributed in skewness. But in kurtosis, when it is three, then it is normal distributed. Okay, guys. So this is the things. Uh, the difference of the skewness and kurtosis. And here, negative skewness is called as left skewed. Positive skewness is called as right skewed. But in kurtosis, negative kurtosis is called as platycutic distribution and positive is called as leptocurtic distribution. Okay, guys. So these are the difference of this skewness and kurtosis. Guys. Okay. Thin, wide, uh, wide peak. Okay. So let me explain you about that. So guys, so when I click on this negative, you can see wide peak and thin tails. So what does that increase? Intimate. So guys, wherever we are going to draw a graph, it has wide peak and thin tails, right? Then it is called as negative. But positive, thin peak and thick tails. Okay. So that is all about kurtosis and fourth moment business decisions. Okay. So after that, we are going to see for data preparation. Okay. So what is this data preparation? So guys, data preparation. As I said, day three, we have seen data pre-processing. Data pre-processing, the process of preparing the raw data and making it suitable for machine learning. Okay. So we are saying why data pre-processing is important. Data pre-processing is a process of preparing the raw data and making it suitable for machine learning. So we do data pre-processing to make comfortable in machine learning what we can use. Okay. And in the first crucial step, by creating this machine learning model, we are going to use for machine learning projects. Okay, and the operation of the data is mandatory, and we are going to clean it in a formatted way. Okay, for this, we use pre-processing task. Okay, guys. So this thing is about data pre-processing. Okay. So why do we need data pre-processing? Right. So I explained about data preprocessing. Why do we need data preprocessing? So a real world. So a real world data generally contains noises, missing values, and everything. Right. So we can't just say data will be perfect. So there will be some errors in data entry errors and data missing errors. Okay. So we need data preprocessing task for cleaning the data and make it suitable. Okay. And we need to increase the accuracy and efficiency of machine learning model. So guys, that is the reason why do we need data pre-processing and what is the steps involved in data pre-processing? The steps involved in data pre-processing is getting the data set, right? So first we should get the data and we're going to import the libraries, importing data sets, finding missing data, encoding categorical data, and we're going to split the train data, right? Splitting the data, train and test and feature scale. So the steps in data pre-processing, first thing is getting the data. And we are going to import the libraries which is required for it. And we are going to import the data sets. Too. And after importing, we are going to find the missing data. What are the missing data we have? And we are going to encode categorical data, splitting data, and we are going to do feature scaling. Okay. So these were the steps involved in data pre processing. So the day four, guys. So the day four, we are going to see the K means clustering. Okay, so we're going to do it practically too. So guys, unsupervised learning. So what is unsupervised learning? Unsupervised learning is a machine learning technique in which models are not supervised using a training data. As I said, guys, the person who learns for himself, he is known as unsupervised learning. Okay, supervised learning means a teacher is teaching and the student is learning. That is known as supervised learning. Unsupervised learning means the person who himself learns. Okay, that is known as unsupervised learning in general terms. Okay, so unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning, what is the goal of unsupervised learning? 
it is where, where we are going to find underlying the structure of the data sets okay? group the data according to similarities and represent the data set in compressed form so means guys so what is the goal of this unsupervised learning is basically we are going to group the data according to their similarities and we are going to represent the data in compressed form and after the result okay the groups with which we have be in do variables okay so our unsupervised learning is guys is a type of algorithm that learns patterns from untagged data okay this unsupervised learning we will be doing uh, So guys, unsupervised learning is nothing but where we are going to see this, okay? Like after supervised learning, so in k-means, we are going to see how the clustering happens in unsupervised learning, okay? So what are the examples of unsupervised learning? So we have seen the examples of unsupervised learnings too. And going to importance of this clustering in automotive analytics. So how this unsupervised learning is important, okay? So unsupervised learning, as I said, guys, it is nothing but the type of algorithm that learns patterns from untagged data means unlabeled data okay and the hope is that uh, through this uh, the important how we are going to learn in uh, people the machine is forced to build a uh, the representation of its word okay how it's going to generate uh, imaginative content from it okay so guys as i said unsupervised learning is nothing but it is also known as unsupervised machine learning it uses machine learning algorithms to analyze and cluster unlabeled data where we can discover the hidden patterns with grouping data and need for human image. Okay. So the importance, what is the importance of this uh, unsupervised learning in automotive analytics? So the development of vehicle electronics is expanding behind features for the vehicle itself. Okay. So here the terminology sentence just describes us how the development of this electronic vehicles is expecting behind the features. So we have seen the future is electric cars, or electric vehicles, right? So how it is going to expand in features, how it's going to connect it to the vehicle of technologies, okay? That things we'll be seeing in this automotive analytics. So we are going to take some data set and we are going to do some clustering, okay? We are going to see how connected vehicle technology targets at this, what is safety of these targets, the mobility, the environmental environments. Okay. So we are going to see how this automotive analytics is involved in KBS clustering. The promise of these technologies has in, uh, induced vehicle manufacturers. Okay. So whenever I say the vehicle is promised with these uh, things, it should be satisfied with that. Okay. So auto suppliers, peak government agencies. Okay. So we know the there are different types of cars, right? The bulletproof and so many things. So we can say uh, the PM, what type of vehicle they're going to use. Uh, that depends on what type of cars they are going to buy. The technology is what they have used. Okay. And uh, we are going to see how it's connected to the vehicle system, how developed it is. Okay. So, so where it is, uh, this testing certain of this automotive analytics, it's in California, I guess. The centers are connected vehicles. Okay, you can see California are centers of vehicle technology development and test. Okay, guys. So, what is this supervised learning? So as I said, guys, when you go to the mind map, right? So so guys, in unsupervised learning, right? Unsupervised learning or descriptive model, we have clustering segmentation. So as I said, yesterday we have seen what is meant by unsupervised learning, but today we'll be seeing what is types of unsupervised learning. Clustering segmentation, guys. Hierarchical cluster. The first thing is hierarchical cluster. So, guys, hierarchical cluster is nothing but it is a um, in data mining and statistics, right? This hierarchical clustering is a method of cluster analysis, okay? That seeks to build hierarchy of clusters. 
So hierarchy group clustering is nothing but is a method of cluster analysis that seeks to build hierarchy of clusters. What is meant by that? So guys, it's going to take a single cluster and it's going to build a cluster. You can generally uh, include like that. So, okay. In that we have two types, agglomerative and divisive clustering. So what is agglomerative clustering? So guys, agglomerative is nothing but bottom to top. So what is meant by bottom to top? A single cell is there. It's going to divide this. Okay. Like this. So this is known as bottom to top approach, where a single cluster from the top is forming so many clusters is called as bottom up approach. Okay. Start with single atom clusters. As I said, we are going to start with single cluster. Okay. And continuously, we're going to merge two clusters. We can see we're going to merge two clusters at the bottom and we are going to go with this. Okay. So basically it starts with single electron, the single clusters, and it's going to divide like this. Okay. And the clusters move on. Okay. The clusters move on like this. It is called as bottom to top of this. Because so we are gonna visualize using this as dendrogram. Okay. We are gonna visualize using dendrogram, which is generated using all the algorithm. So, guys, dendrogram, dendrogram, this. How we are going to visualize? We are going to decide the number of clusters by analyze by analyzing using the dendrogram. So these clusters, guys, we are going to decide. Okay, these clusters we are going to decide using dendrogram, analyzing using dendrogram. Okay, so that is the meaning of this clustering. Okay, bottom up and dendrogram. After that, we are going to see how distance is used to find similarity between the items. So basically, we are going to record distance between two records. And we're going to see what is the clusters. Okay. We'll be seeing distance between two rockets, what we have. Okay. So guys, after that, we're going to see what is the distance property. Okay. And we'll be seeing distance properties. And we'll be seeing cluster evaluation techniques. Okay. So guys, after that, we'll be seeing normalize and standardize. Okay. So this thing we'll be seeing. And you can see so let me go to that. So guys, unsupervised learning. Okay, I think the mouse was glitched. So guys, clustering segmentation we were seeing, and we have seen uh, what type of clusterings we are gonna use, right? Hierarchy clustering is nothing but method of question analysis that seeks to be hierarchy of clusters. And we'll be seeing in hierarchical clustering, we have agglomerative and divisive. So agglomerative is nothing but bottom up approach. A single atom is formed different, okay? And divisive clustering. So guys, divisive clustering is nothing but top to down approach, okay? Bottom to up approach and top to down. So after that, start with a huge of macro clusters split continuously to two groups, generating hierarchy of clusters, okay? So guys, what is DIANA? So it's nothing but divisive analysis. So we have two types of clustering, guys. One is agglomerative and one is divisive. Okay, bottom to top approach and top to bottom approach. So guys, this was all about hierarchical cluster. So non-hierarchical clustering. So K-means, K-medians, okay, all type of modes we have. And moving on, guys, we have density-based cluster and grid-based so in density based clustering guys we have two types okay application with noise the two parameters border point okay and we have grid based clustering okay and the evaluation techniques guys. so what are the evaluation techniques we have in this clustering segmentation okay so dimension reduction so which reduces the dimension okay so it is called as dimension reduction so dimension reduction is nothing but basically it's going to reduce the higher dimension to the lower dimensions okay? and that we have linear patterns are handled by different components okay like uh, linear discriminant lda okay so what is meant by lda right so lda is nothing but linear discriminant analysis okay 
So guys, it is an example of topic model and it is used to classify text in a document of particular topic. Basically, this uh, latent uh, discriminant analysis guys is all uh, is all uh, is also called as like basically I can say it's gonna uh, detect the model and it's gonna classify text document in a particular topic. Okay, it, it builds a topic per document model and words per topic. Model. So it's gonna divide this to give us the topic model. Okay. So after that, we are going to see non-negative matrix factorization. The name itself says NMF, right? NMF is nothing but NMF is nothing but guys, non-negative matrix factorization. Okay. So this non-negative matrix factorization, guys, it is used to decompose the document term. Okay? Matrix using two simple matrices. One is document topic matrices, and another is topic term matrices. Okay, we have two things here, guys. As I said, one is uh, I can say document topic. Okay. One is document topic matrices, and the next one is topic term matrices. Okay. So this type of two things we have guys for non-negative matrix factorization. So the next thing we are going to see is IC independent component analysis, right? So independent component analysis. Guys. So what is this independent component analysis, right? What is IC in data science? So it extracts hidden features like hidden factors within data by transforming a set of variables to any set and maximally, maximally independent. Okay, This ICA basically relies on the measures of this Gaussian identity to complete the whole task. Okay. Independent analysis is nothing but extract hidden facts within data by transforming set of variables. So that was all about this independent component analysis. Case. So next thing we are going to see is SVD, singular value decomposition. Okay. So singular value decomposition, what are the applications? So let us see the applications of SVD are recommendation system and we have network analysis and image process. Okay. Network analytics is network analytics is nothing but what type of things will recommendation system guys. So basically when you search something, so we'll be getting a recommendation, right? So basically any products what we got. Is called as recommendation system. So when we search for any products, we'll be seeing other products too. That is called as recommendation engines. For example, I can say searching some products like some, uh, 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 I can say as mobiles, searching some I may, uh, Android mobiles. Okay. Then this flip card automatically it's going to suggest you different type of OS like iPhone and everything. So it is done by recommendation engine, different type of phones, what you're going to search. Okay. And image processing, the applications of SVD are this. So what is SVD? Singular value decomposition is nothing but a matrix of factorization. It like the matrix into three matrices. Okay, it has some interesting algebraic properties which may convert. Uh, it's going to convey important geometrical theoretical insights. Okay, so why what, for what this SVD is used for? So SVD is widely used technique to decompose a matrix into several component matrices. Okay. It is a wide use of technique to decompose a matrix into several component matrices. Okay, we're going to exposing of the user, okay, and interesting properties of the original matrix. So, guys, that is what is by singular value decomposition. And what is the Python code? The package is what we are going to use for SVD. So, guys, sklearn dot decomposition is called SVD decomposition. Okay. So the next thing we are going to do see is PCA, principal component analysis. So what is PCA? It's a process of, okay, it is a process of computing the principal components and using them to perform change on basis of the data. So what is the meaning of this PCA? Okay, I can say this PCA, how does this PCA is going to work? Okay, so guys, PCA, this principal component analysis, 
this statistical procedure okay that all is that allows you to summarize the information contained in large data tables by means of smaller set of summary indices that can be more easily visualized and analyzed okay it's a uh, popular unsupervised learning tool okay it's gonna technique for reducing dimensionality of the data okay so this is all about this higher uh, dimensional reduction of linear things and guys next thing we're gonna see is association rules association rules is also called as relationship mining as i said affinity analysis and market work study okay so what is this association rules so guys association rule uh, the statements that help to show the probability of relationship between data items within large data set in various top data sets okay so what are different type of association rules so we have multi relational association rules and we have generalized association rules quantitative association rules and we have interval information association rules okay so we have this type of association rules the first one is multi relational association rules and the next one we have is generalized association rules and the third okay quantitative association rules and the fourth is interval information association rules. okay so this type of different association rules we have okay so this was all about this association rules okay so after that it is also called as market basket analysis affinity analysis and relationship by so guys so after that we are going to see a priori algorithm so what is this a priori algorithm right so a priori algorithm it's nothing but guys it was uh, given by r agarwal and okay so it was discovered by r agarwal and shikan in 1994 if you want the complete details so a priori algorithm refers of an algorithm okay it refers to an algorithm that is used in mining frequent product sets and relevant associations okay so generally this a priori algorithm operates a database containing a huge number of transactions for example so i can say the item customers uh, in a mart or any big bazaar okay so basically guys a priori algorithm refers to an algorithm that is used in mining frequent products sets and relevant association rules so generally this a priori algorithm operates on database containing a huge number of transaction so as i said huge number of transaction this a priori algorithm is too much easy for them to use okay so what does this a priori algorithm do so guys as i said when it, we have large number of these things large number of uh, transactions we are going to use a priori algorithm so what does this a priori algorithm is going to do so same thing guys the a priori algorithm is used for minimum frequent as i said so item set and dividing association rules from a transactional database okay the parameters we have support and confidence are used okay so we have two things here guys so you can see support and confidence so uh, support refers to items okay item frequency of occurrence okay and confidence is a conditional probability <laughs> okay so guys items in a transaction for an item so guys support and confidence so support guys range starts from 0 to 1 and the confidence also the range starts from 0 to 
it has antecedent support and consequence. Okay, this type of supports we have for applied algorithm and the lift ratio, the leverage, the conviction. Okay, so when I go for this lift ratio, okay, the range starts from zero to infinity, and the range starts from minus one to plus one, depends on the okay. And next one we have is the sequential pattern mining. So, what type of association rules is going to use the packages, the Python packages? So, we have ML extend or frequent underscore patterns, the function, the a priori algorithms, and associations. So, the next thing is, guys, we are going to see is a recommendation system. Okay. Next one we are going to see is a recommendation. Okay. So, what is this recommendation system? This subclass of informing filtering system. Okay, that seeks to predict the rating of performance. This is the preference used in an item. Okay. So, what is meant by recommendation system? A recommender system or recommendation system is a subclass. It's basically going to give you the suggestion. So, let me say you are buying something and automatically a recommendation comes, right? This is done by recommendation system. So, what type of things you're going to look for? So, when you're going to look for something in uh, eating products, for example, or something, you're going to get different type of products. If you're going to go for Amazon or looking for something like uh, the iPhones, they're going to suggest you different type of uh, phones, right? So, it is done by recommendation system. <clears throat> okay. And if you ask me, what are the types of recommendation system? So, basically, there are majority of six types of recommendation system, right? We have collaborative recommender system, content based recommender system, utility based, knowledge based, and much more. Okay, and popularity based, depend on what type of this. So, guys, popularity based. So, what type of things basically so many people are buying? So, it's going to recommend us regarding the popularity what we are going to look for. It is called as popularity based. Okay, so recommendation system, we have collaborative filtering. I said how it's going to work. So it's going to depend on traditional collaborative filtering, search-based method. So what is your sequence research basis? Okay, it's going to depend on that. How to reduce this computational burden? How this success, success depends on this recommendation engine? Okay, so what is to item to it collaborative filtering? What is the limitation of this collaborative filtering? Okay, so how do you, how we are going to recommend this to new users? How do we, do we recommend for new items? So we're going to start by, okay. So this is what is meant by collaborative filtering. Okay. So in network analytics, network data is also called as graph data. Okay. Network data is, not, is also called as graph data. So what does network contains? So network contains vertices and edges. Space. So vertices are nodes and edges are links. Okay. Network can be represented as adjacency matrix. Okay. And network can be direct or indirected to directed or indirect by uh, it might be unidirectional or bidirectional. Okay. So what are the Python packages, the functions? Okay. So this was about unsupervised learning. So we are gonna see the K means question. Okay. So we have seen the importance of this thing. So next thing we are going to go for K means cluster. So what is K means cluster? K means is one search unsupervised learning method that aims to group similar data in parts of clusters. Okay. It's going to allow the clusters of data into different groups. It's going to convene and discover the categories. Okay without any training, okay? We don't need up for anything. So guys, K means clustering. So K means clustering, what does it mean? It is nothing but a type of unsupervised learning, which is used when you have unlabeled data, okay? When we have unlabeled data, we are gonna use this K means cluster, okay? The goal of this algorithm is to find groups in the data, okay, with number of group represented by the variable k. Okay, so k means clustering is a type of unsupervised learning 
which is used to have when we produce it when we have unlabeled data okay and the goal of this thing is to find the groups in the data with number of group represented by the variable of k okay so how this k means clustering is gonna work so k means gonna work based on centroid based clustering algorithm is where you are going to calculate the distance between each point and a centroid to assign it to a cluster. Okay. The goal is to identify the k number of groups in the data set. The goal is to find and we are going to identify the k, the number of clusters in the data set. Okay. So, what are this the uh, k means cluster? So it allows us to cluster the data into different groups and we're going to use it in a convenient way to discover the categories of groups in the unlabeled data set on its own without the need of training of it. Okay, guys. So basically, uh, it allows us to use to cluster the data into different groups and we're going to use it in a convenient way okay, without the need of any training data. And it is a centroid based algorithm where each cluster is associated with a centroid. Okay. It is a centroid based algorithm where each cluster is associated with a centroid. The main aim of this algorithm is to minimize the sum of distance between the data point and their corresponding clusters. So, the main aim is the goal of this algorithm is to minimize the sum of distances between the data point and their corresponding clusters. Okay, so guys, in K means clustering, why it is called as K means? So, in other words, guys, K means algorithm identifies K number of centroids, it allocates every data point to the nearest cluster source while keeping the centroid as small as possible. The means in K means refers to averaging the data, okay, that is finding the centroid. So, how we are going to calculate this K means? So we're going to select the number of clusters. Okay. After that, we're going to select K points at random, make K clusters. We're going to repeat all these steps. Calculate. So where is this K means used for? So K means clustering can be used in almost every domain. Okay. Ranging from banking to recommendation, cybersecurity, document clustering, and even in image segmentation. Okay. is typically applied to data that has smaller number of dimension is numeric and it is continuous. So what are the objectives of this k-means cluster? The k-means the optimization is to minimize the total squared error between the training samples and the representative prototypes. This is the equivalent for minimizing trace of pooled within the cover. So we have seen. So guys, so guys, what are the steps involved in KMS cluster? The steps: initialize centroids of K for each sample in the set of samples. So what are the steps we are going to involve in KMS cluster? Okay. First thing we are going to initialize the centroid scheme for each sample set of samples. Assign sample to the closest cluster k based on Euclidean distance. So what is Euclidean distance? So between centroid value and observed value, we are going to calculate the Euclidean distance. Okay. For each cluster to set of this, after finding the closest cluster k based on Euclidean distance, we are going to find each cluster in the set of clusters. Okay. We are going to recalculate the cluster centroid based on the mean of the samples in the cluster. Okay. We are going to recalculate the cluster centroids based on the mean of samples in the cluster. And we are going to repeat the steps okay, until we are going to get the criteria. And we are going to determine the variance of each cluster or the sum. So we are going to call it as SSC. 
sum of each characters and we are going to repeat all the steps to till we get the initialization of the page. so these steps are very important so what are the steps involved in k means clustering the k means clustering okay the first thing is to initialize in the center of its k and we are gonna find each example in the set of examples we are gonna repeat the steps until the criteria is fulfilled we are going to determine the variance. We are going to repeat the steps until this one to five different initialization of the clusters. We are going to determine the variance of each clusters. Okay. So these things we are going to do in steps involved in K-means clusters. Okay. So what type of algorithm is K-means going to use? So K-means going to use unsupervised learning algorithm. Okay. K-means clustering is a unsupervised learning algorithm. So that is no label data for this question, unlike supervised learning. So, guys, so you have to uh, listen carefully here. So, what type of algorithm K means is going to use? What type of algorithm? Right? So, so what type of algorithm the K means algorithm is going to use? So, K means is K means questioning is an unsupervised learning algorithm. There is no label data for this question. Unlike in supervised learning, okay? this K means performs the division of objects into clusters that share similarities and dissimilar to the objects okay? belonging to other clusters. The term K is a number. Okay? So you can say why this is this K means algorithm is also called as lazy algorithm. This K means is also called as lazy algorithm. Okay. This, why this K means is also called as lazy algorithm is because guys, it does a, it because it does no training at all. Okay, it does not train at all. And when you supply the training, because it does no training data, it is uh, but does but because what why it, it is called as lazy algorithm because it does no training at all. When you supply the training data, a training time, all it is doing is storing the complete data set, but it does not do any calculation at all. So why it is called as lazy learning is because all the time it is just storing the data, complete data it's going to store, but it does not do any calculation at that point. So that, that is the reason it is called as lazy algorithm. Okay. So what are the advantages of K-means clustering? So what are the advantages? Guys? The advantages of K-means clustering. K-means is the most used clustering method, largely due to being computational index. Okay, it is the most used in clustering method because it's computationally inexpensive. Okay, the cost is less and it can scale well with the large data. So if we have large data, it is best to use K means. Okay, because it can do wonders with big data, means the large data. And it is an appropriate method when you know the number of clusters to be drawn from the data set. So this sentence says that when we have appropriate method, where the number of clusters be drawn from the data sets, we have an appropriate method. Okay. So this was the advantages of K-means clusters. So I said there is only advantages. Are there any disadvantages of K-means clusters? Yes. So K-means has trouble clustering data where clusters are varying sizes and density. So it has troubles, guys. This game is a troubling clustering data where clusters are of varying sizes and density. Okay. The clusters such data, you need to generalize K means as described in advantage section. Okay. The centroids can, can be dragged by outliers. Okay. The centroids can be dragged by outliers. Okay. Outliers must get their own cluster instead of being ignored. So these are the disadvantages of K means cluster. And limitation. So what are the limitations we have? So number of clusters must be chosen up front. Okay. Number of uh, clusters must be chosen up front. And outliers can have a strong influence on this. As I said this, sometimes the centroids can be dragged by the outliers. The same thing here. Outliers can have a strong influence on results. This initial centroid positions have a strong influence on results too. And the clusters will be clusters of varying sizes and densities. Okay. So limitations. Number of clusters must be chosen up front. Outliers can have a strong influence on results. 
initial centroid position have a strong influence on results. It's not gonna cluster with well varying sizes and densities. These are the limitations what we have for K-means questions. Okay. So we have seen what is unsupervised learning, what is K-means clustering. Okay, we have seen why this K-means clustering is gonna work. So the next thing we are gonna see is how we are gonna implement K-means clustering. Okay, how we are gonna implement the data of automotive analytics in K-means clustering. How we are gonna implement that. Okay, guys. So, so guys, we can I have loaded the data in Google Colab. Okay. So this is my data. Okay, the automotive analytics. This is my data, guys. So, guys, so before going to the codes, let me explain you about this Google Colab. Okay, so in Google Colab, we can load IPYNB. Yes. Okay, dot IPYNB files only that. So dot py files we cannot load it. Okay. So that is the one thing, guys. So Google Color. So guys, when you open Google Color, you can see the user interface will be like this. So you can see the code. So here we have to run the cell by cell. Okay, we have to run this. So like that. So one more thing here you have is FIDA. So most commonly used guys for coding purposes, we are going to use this FIDA. It is also a Python tool where we can run our Python codes. Okay. So here you can see file search run debug at the project tools. Okay. The console window, the editor window, the variable exporter. This is the R Studio. Okay, we have the use here. R Studio. Variable Explorer. And we have is console console. So this is Python. So basically, we can run here only dot py files. Okay, we can't run ipy and p file. So this is one thing, guys. You can run only dot py files. Okay, dot py files you can run in spider. Okay, while in Google Colab, you can run ipy and p file. So that's k means cluster. So while doing anything, we should import libraries. The first thing we are seeing is collect the data. So before that, we have to import the libraries. You can see import libraries. So guys, importing libraries, we have import numpy as well. So what does that basically mean? So numpy is nothing but numerical calculator. So we are going to import that library as n. We're going to give it the name it as n. And next thing we are gonna, these are the libraries guys, basically the Python libraries which we are gonna use. Okay, the first thing is importing numpy as a numerical character. And we're gonna import matplotlib.py import as field for graphical representation. For graphical representation. So for graphical representation, we are gonna use matplotlib. So the library guys, so we have different libraries as NumPy, we have libraries as Matplotlib, okay, the Pandas is PD for data manipulation, okay, for data manipulation, we are going to use Pandas, guys. okay. So these are the different libraries we have in KBs cluster. The first one is NumPy as NP, and the next one we have is Matplotlib, and we have pandas as speed. So we have imported the libraries. So why did we import libraries? So we have to work on it. So we need Python to import the libraries. So after importing the libraries, guys, after importing all libraries which is required to do K-means clustering, I am gonna import the data set. Okay, so I'm gonna import the data set. So importing the data set, the data set pd.read.es. So guys. We are, we have what importing the data set. Okay. So as I said automotive analytics. I have imported my data as cars, cars that I have imported. Okay. So data set dot in. So what does this basically say? It is gonna give all the info I have in my data set. Okay. The information it is gonna give about the data set what we 
okay, you can see pandas pro range index is 261 entries 0 to 60 what is my columns what is my column consists the my columns has mpg cylinders uh, hp so guys whenever i say vehicle you can see what is the mileage what is the cylinder what is horsepower what is the speed what is the brand what is the year what is the uh way lbs and time to 60. <laughs> so how what speed can drive so this thing i have information in my data set. so i'm going to repeat it once again this is google collaborates okay so where we are going to run it by slide cell by cell this is called as the whole thing okay the whole thing is called as a cell so after selling that we're gonna okay in google collab we have to run it cell by cell so you can see a run button here so i clicked on that I have run my data and i have imported my data okay i have imported my data set cars data set in automotive one so i'm gonna perform on that data set dot in okay basically it is going to give us the information the mpg the cylinders okay so what all things we have in cars okay and we have float one and it is four okay so data set dot head so it's gonna give us the first five more values okay we don't mention anything in data set head it's gonna give us the first five more values, okay so python investing starts from zero okay so if i write python here the indexing starts from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. Always remember that, guys. This is front indexing, back indexing. Back indexing of Python starts from minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, and minus. So this is how indexing is going to start. So, okay, it's going to start. So you can ask, why did you explain me about that? So here you can you can see the indexing starts from zero, one, two, three, four. So here it means it's going to give five, right? So it's going to take zero as Python indexing. In simple terms to explain. Okay. So guys, after exploring this uh, data set head, we are going to go for what type of cylinders? Okay. So data set dot is going to give us the complete details. Okay. So, so guys, we are going to see what is this. Okay. So in X data set, so here you can see we have string data this year, okay. but I want a numerical data. Okay. So you can see we have in row here, but here I want only numerical data. Okay. Guys. So, data set dot i log okay, basically it's going to convert data into array okay basically it's going to convert data into array so guys converting data into array so we have got an array like this what is a data type object and everything okay so after that we are gonna convert data into data so guys here x is nothing but a variable okay, you can give any name okay you can give your name itself so it doesn't matter the variable and as i said this is a google column will be will be running set by set okay the cell by cell i think it's okay after converting data into converted array we are gonna convert into data frame so why we want to convert into data frame so what is the reason so guys the variable x we have given okay so guys so this uh, x variable what we have given right so it is very important okay so the variable we have defined like this and we have given we have converted data into converted array so why do we convert it so we have converted it into array okay so after converting it into array we are gonna convert that into data frame after converting that we are gonna convert that into data frame okay why we want to convert into data frame because the data which we connected array we should always convert it to data frame okay so guys after that we are going to divide so you can see 
I'm going to run this and you can see. So let me run this guys. You can see array. So when I run this, okay, you can see we have converted it into array. So after converting it into array guys, I have converted it into, okay. I have converted it into the data frame. Okay. So you can see converting data into data. So here guys, I have converted the data to the data frame. But you can see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right? We have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So I want it to be named, right? So what thing I'm going to do? So here, so here, guys, you can see the K means clustering. How are we going to apply? So first thing, what did I do? This is a Google Colab place. I, it might be a new thing for you. So uh, you can see what we run is called as a cell. Okay? I think what we run, it is a cell. So, okay, after running the cell, we are going to import the data set. So, okay, so my car automotive analytics, I have imported the data. Okay, I'm gonna load that car data. After loading the car data, I'm gonna run it. Okay. So data, data set, which I have loaded, right? It is very important in the sense, okay? So guys, after running this data set, okay? after running the data set, So the data set, what we loaded, after loading the data set, we are going to see what all the information we have, that's the data set, okay? So what are the data sets we have, okay? So after getting the information of data, what all we have, we are going to see the info of the data set, okay? We are going to see the info of the data set. So after seeing info of the data set, okay? So guys, info of the data set means it's gonna give us the information. Okay, it's gonna give us the information. After getting the information, guys, basically. Okay, after getting the information, we are gonna see what is the data set we have. Okay. So after loading, we'll go, we are going to see the information what we have. Okay. What information we have in the data set. Okay. So, so guys, after that, getting this data set. Okay. So, the information what we have in the data, you can see. So, we have no null count, the data type is float, integer, and everything. Right. So after loading this guys, okay. So after loading this, you can see what type of data set we have. Okay. So the informations what we have. After having all the information of the data sets, we are gonna load them. So we have integer, float, object, and everything. Okay. So after that, we are gonna get the data set of text. So we are going to go for ILA. Okay. So the data is converted into array. So after we are going to convert that data into data frames. After that, we are going to convert data into data frame. Okay. After converting data into data frame. Okay. After converting data into data frame, guys. We are going to see. So, wherever there is numeric, convert it to numeric. So, we are going to convert that numeric. If there is numeric, convert it to the thing. Okay. So, this is what our data set guys. We have 261 rows and 7 columns. Okay. So, we have PG cylinders. We have weight LBS. Okay. So, guys. After that converting, okay. After converting this data set, we are gonna see for the null values. We are gonna look for null values. So after looking for null values, we are gonna go for is null and somewhere. So where we have null values, we are gonna remove them. Okay, we are gonna replace them. 
So after replacing, we are gonna see, we are gonna eliminate the null value. So here you can see, we have null values two, in LBS we have three. So we are gonna eliminate the null values, okay? We are gonna loop over all the variables. So basically we have seen, we have, is null values two here and three here. So we are gonna eliminate the null values by looping all over the variables. Okay, so you can see for i in x dot columns, we are gonna fill null values of integer. So what we are gonna do, we are gonna do mean imputation. Okay, mean imputation is done in all missing values at columns. So what all the mean imputation is done? We have all missing values at columns. Okay, and after that, we are gonna print the null values in that column. Okay, we are gonna print the null values what we have in that column. So guys, you can see here, we have missing values, okay? So we had two and three cubic inches and the weight LBS. So what is the weight of the card we have, okay? And the data type was integer. So we had missing values here. So now I have to remove the missing values if I am doing that. So if I want to train my model, there should be no missing values. What happens if you have missing values? So if you have missing values, the machine learning can give us the wrong reports, okay? The wrong accuracy. So that is the reason what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna remove the numbers for i in x dot columns. So that x dot columns, what I'm doing, I am filling n. So wherever the null values are there, I'm filling that into x i dot mean. So mean imputation is done in all the missing values. So wherever we have missing values, I'm gonna do mean imputation. Okay, I'm gonna type is null dot sum. So I'm gonna print all the null values in that column. So guys, I have removed the values, okay? So when I'm gonna run that, you can see we have missing values like this. Okay, now it's all zero. And after that, this we are gonna use elbow method, okay? We are gonna use elbow method to find optimal number of clusters, okay? So to import that, we are gonna use a library called from sklearn.cluster import k-means. Okay, so we are gonna import sklearn.cluster. So we are gonna import k means. Okay, so after that, we are gonna see. So the variable we can write tcwss also, or we can write twss also, guys. Okay, depends on you what is the variable you are giving. Okay, so in the range of one is to eleven, the k means clustering. So what is k means clustering? This unlabeled data, unsupervised learning algorithm. K means is the unsupervised learning algorithm. So what is unsupervised learning? Which has unlabeled data, where the student studies himself. That is unsupervised learning. Okay, and supervised learning is nothing but a teacher is teaching a student. That is supervised learning. Okay, so for I in range, so this K means clustering. I'm gonna give this clusters. So what is my cluster? Okay, I'm gonna fit the K means and I'm gonna append K means inertia. Okay, so after appending the k-means inertia, I'm gonna use the title. Okay, so what is our uh, graph I use? So I'm gonna use the algo method and what is my number of clusters? Okay, so you can see the algo methods we have number of clusters like two, four, six, eight, ten, and you can see the variable here. So applying this k-means in the cars data set within the with three clusters. Okay, basically I'm gonna see where we have seen the more loop is three. So we can give two also, three also. I have to three, number of clusters is three, okay? The K means plus is to get proper initialization, okay? This K means plus, plus, plus. You can see here, we have K means plus, plus. It's nothing but to get proper initialization. So K means clusters, I have given I, and the proper initialization, the random state, I'm gonna fit that, okay? And I'm gonna use PLT dot I'm gonna use the elbow method. You can see what is my elbow method. After applying K means to the car data set, guys, I'm going to take my clusters as three. Okay. So you can see the clusters as three here. And this K means clustering, guys. So I'm going to give clusters as three. K means plus plus, we have seen to get proper initialization. And the iteration is 300, initialization in 10, and the random state is zero. Okay. So, and then we'll see the K means so I'm gonna fit the prediction. So guys, you can see the number of clusters in elbow method. So this is my elbow method. And you can see the number of clusters for me is three. Okay. 
and I'm going to import NumPy, guys. Okay. After the elbow method, I'm going to visualize my this KMS cluster. Okay. We're going to get the proper KMS clustering. So we installed KMS plus plus for proper initialization. The elbow method we have used. Okay. So what is the number of clusters? Uh, we are going to import SKL under clusters. Okay. We have seen the null values, right? So guys, in Google Calab, you can use IP by NB one thing. And in the spider, guys, you can't use an IP one bit. Okay. You can see, you can use in spider, we can use only dot py files. Okay. So that is a difference between this Google Colab and uh, spider guys. So I make sure when I'm giving the sessions, uh, I'll be dealing with different type of uh, IDEs, okay, integration data, okay. So we'll be seeing this deck, we'll be using different EDs, IDs. So uh, we have seen Google Colab and we'll be seeing uh, spider, Python, many more as we move on. So for K means now I have to this. So guys, the elbow methods, we have this, we have seen the max iteration. So we are going to visualize our data. Guys. So visualizing the clusters. So guys, what is visualizing the clusters? So I'm going to see what is the brands. We have. Okay. So here you can see guys, I have removed. Okay. So here I have converted numeric quality to alt, but what does zero, one, two, three, four, five indicates? So that is the time. I have given my X columns, the names, MPG, cylinders, cubic inches, and many more. Okay. So when I run that guys, we're going to rename the columns here. Okay. We're, after renaming the columns, we're going to go for eliminating the null values. Okay. We're going to plot the range. Okay. And after that, we're going to visualize the clusters. Okay. We're going to visualize our clusters. So you can see what is the cluster of carbines here. So US we have red. Japan, we have blue, okay. The centroids, what is the clusters of reds, okay. So this is how we're gonna visualize the K-means cluster using this code space, okay. So let me run this. So guys, so I have run the code. So that is the thing it is showing us the error, okay. So you can see it's gonna execute all the things, okay. So guys, as I have run the code, so the multiple times without running anything, it was showing error for us. So this is what we are going to do clustering. So we have done clusters. Okay. So we have seen the clusters. So we are getting error because we didn't run the last last code space. Okay, that is the reason. Okay. So you can see I have renamed my columns here. So here we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. But I don't understand anything. Here. So for the X columns, I'm going to rename my columns as FPG, cylinders, cubic inches, weights, and everything. So you can see it has given us the name. And after that, I'm going to eliminate by looping all over the values what we have. I'm going to do V imputation. I'm going to print the null values of the columns what we have. Okay. And after that, I'm going to use the elbow method. So from SK learner cluster, I'm going to import from kids. Okay. So after that, I'm going to run for I in range what I have. Okay, so K means plus plus we have seen it is used to nothing but get proper initialization and the max iteration was given 300. And the plot, guys, so when I run the plot, you can see the elbow method. Okay, so we learn this code. So for I in range, and you can see the code and the elbow method we have got, guys. Okay, so before running any other queries, the cells we have done all the cells what you have done. Okay, after applying K means car data set, so this is the thing what we're gonna get. And the NumPy thing, and this is our visualizations. The okay, visualization of clusters. So the centroids are basically gonna group the data, which is very uh, depends on the car brands. Work. So guys, in K means clustering, we have used all the libraries. So guys, we have so many different libraries. We are, uh, we are gonna use when we are gonna go with different tools, right? So we have used the uh, K means today. So we'll be going with K and linear regression and much more. Okay. So importing the libraries, okay, this NumPy as NP, the Matplotlib, the PYT, okay, Pantas as PD. So different type of things libraries will be using guys for this. We have used libraries like NumPy, Matplotlib, okay, and we have Pantas, okay. So if you search on seeing different libraries, you have different type of libraries, sklearn.clusters for k-means, okay, and we have 
these libraries we have used for k-means cluster. So guys, in today's session, we have seen, okay. So what was our agenda, guys? Okay. So when you go to the PPT, the automotive analytics, okay. So we have seen what is the limitations and all, right? So unsupervised learning, we have seen the k-means clustering, the example, okay. The input data, what all we have, okay. The segregation of the data it has been done. Okay. So we have seen what is the importance of clustering in automotive analytics. So how this automotive analytics is important. Okay. And the k-means clustering. So what are the steps involved? So we followed all the steps which is involved for k-means clustering, guys. So we have to this k-means clustering. Okay. And limitations, what we have, the advantages. Okay, the advantages of k-means clustering. Okay. So advantage of k-means clustering we have seen. And we have seen the steps too. And after that, we have seen what is our limitations of k-means clustering. Okay. So this was all for today's session, guys. Right? So make sure if in case if you have missed any session, go and watch the recorded videos. Okay. So thank you for attending the session, guys. Uh, meet tomorrow.